Titan. Uh, I've been doing gerontology at the School of Pharmacology and Biomolecular Sciences. So let's give uh, Richard a good welcome. Drosophila, a few weeks. Salmon, suicidal reproduction. On the plant side, you have single cell, you have sort of small multicellular plants like Volvox, and you have plants like soybeans, quite short lived. And on the other hand, you have these guys that may be long lived. There's the giant tortoise. People really don't get quite how misnamed giant tortoise actually is. It should have been called the oh my god it's bloody enormous tortoise because we honeymooned in Mauritius to look at these things and they are the size of your sofa. They're also extremely long lived. Okay, They are not a tractable laboratory species. They are however more tractable than the sturgeon Okay, about six foot long with more teeth than the Osmond family. Okay, which is itself more tractable than another species that we can look at, the bowhead whale. Okay, the only ultra-long-lived animal suitable probably as a laboratory specimen for studying creatures with significantly longer lifespans than us is this, the Icelandic cyprine or the quay hog. If you watch Family Guy, you'll be intimately associated with quay hogs. If you've ever had a bowl of clam chowder, the animals in your bowl of clam chowder will probably have been at least 80 years old, okay? And the oldest quay hogs are over 400 at least. This is a very, very good cat. They're actually lovely, we have some in the lab. They're really cute insofar as a bivalve can actually be cute, okay? And on the plant side, we see very long-lived organisms like the bristle cone pine and the English oak. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, basically, 
to go beyond my sort of David Attenborough, looking at the rich diversity of life on Earth. Okay, I'd like to try and get into this a bit more. Simply collecting life histories, which is what was done in the early part of gerontology, it's quite fun, but it's not really informative. And we need to try and put life histories into the context of theories designed to test different aspects of the biology of aging. And you can look remarkably deaf if you don't do this, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, I have now taken three organisms with defined lifespans and arranged them in order of height. I live longer than the mouse, and the giant redwood lives longer than me. Ergo, aging is caused by being short. <coughs> okay, one does need considerably better theoretical models than this. And so, the two big questions in the biology of aging are, first of all, why do you see aging at all? And the second one is, if there's a good rationale for it, how does it happen? There are two evolutionary theories that have been proposed to account for the semi-ubiquitous nature of aging in the biosphere. They are called disposable soma and antagonistic pleiotropy. The differences between them are only significant if you were on disposable soma or antagonistic pleiotropy. The essence of them is both of these theories allow for what we observe, which are the few non-aging organisms, but they also explain why you would see selection for aging. Both theories predict that non-aging organisms usually get out, out competed <coughs> by aging ones. I you normally tend to think in sort of antagonistic pleiotropy terms, and they go a little bit like this. If you look in the wild, chronologically old organisms are rare. This is true even if the organism is non-aging, because they get eaten. Okay. And the result is you always have fewer offspring from chronologically old organisms than you do from chronologically young organisms, even if there's nothing wrong with them. The result is that you get selection for any gene which has beneficial effects on fecundity, number of offspring, early on in the life course even if that is associated with deleterious effects on the organism later on. Okay? It's roughly like me turning around and saying, I'll give you a deal. I will pay all of your bills from now on with one condition, which is if you reach the age of 600, you pay me back everything you've borrowed. Now, most people will take that deal. They'll be much less keen to take that deal if I pay, if I ask you to pay me back when you're 65. Okay? And it's that sort of bet. Before I leave this, I would say these are theories. They're pretty good theories, but they are not tablets of stone handed down from Mount Abbott. They have the number of experimental systems they have been tested in are quite limited. There are interesting exceptions emerging to them, which means that one needs to think in much broader terms about how aging evolves, to include foraging costs and other things along those lines. But as a sort of entry-level purchase into why we age, both of these are actually quite good. So, what does this tell us? Well, evolutionary theory tells us two things, and one's reassuring and the other one's not. Okay. Evolutionary theory tells us that the aging process is malleable. Okay. Species can change their lifespan, we think, over relatively short periods of evolutionary time, five, ten thousand generations, because what is being selected for is early life fecundity and nothing else. It also tells us that how this process works could be horribly complicated, and it could mean that there is a limited amount we can learn about one species from studying another. One of the big problems, of course, that underpins an evolutionary approach to biology and gives it its power is you can study DNA replication in E. coli with reasonable hopes that you're also, anything you learn will be applicable to DNA replication in yeast or DNA replication in me, because it's a concern. That doesn't necessarily hold for evolution of aging. So you may be using conserved processes, you may not. Okay. Despite those caveats, and those caveats run right the way through biology of aging, we have made some spectacular breakthroughs in extending the healthy lifespan of model organisms. I would say this is a quick run through. If anybody wants to discuss something in more detail, I'm more than happy to do it. I see we've got whiteboard pens. Okay. <coughs>